Welcome back to the Pilgrim Faith Podcast, where human wonder fuels the quest for Christian wisdom. Dale and I are just completely delighted today to be joined by Jason M. Baxter, who just wrote this excellent work, The Medieval Mind of C.S. Lewis, How Great Books Shaped a Great Mind, which you can see right here. Um, For those who are part of our podcast, you know that Dale and I talk about Lewis all the time. And uh, uh, Jason, first of all, just thanks for being here. We're really happy to, to have you on and, and just throw your book as widely as we can throw it for you. Um, mm-hmm. uh, thanks. You can't imagine, you know, from where Dale and I sit, we, we have both kind of developed a project together, Dale and I, in some ways over the last two or three years. And a lot of that has been engaging through, has, has been our, our kind of home base in a sense, has been to work through law, uh, several writings of Lewis uh, we had Michael Ward on and such to talk about Planet Narnia. Um, but one of the things that this book just spoke to me about, because we talk about Lewis all the time, and we talk about him on this register in a sense, is C.S. Lewis, both as a, as a medieval man, somebody who's, who's traveled so widely in the medieval world that he is, as he puts kind of a native there. Um, but, so, but there's this way in which Lewis is, has this other foot in the modern world. And as a modern man, and he's trying to he's trying to speak very directly to contemporary civilization, uh, and we again we talk about this all the time on the program. Speak very directly to, to to contemporary civilization without fundamentally dismissing it. You know, without thinking modernity is just kind of like a, a sideshow in the history of divine providence. Rather, modernity is a brings a bunch of challenges, but also brings its own gifts. Of which C.S. Lewis, in some sense, is is in one way the representative. His a, a, a person who, in one way, his writing style, his the, the manner in which he consolidates the focus on the person. C.S. Lewis, in one sense, is drawing together a bunch of modern motifs as well and, and, and inflecting it with the wisdom of this Catholic tradition for, in a sense, mass man. <laughs> you know, he's throwing this out to just anybody who can read English and is moderately educated. Uh, and, and the way in which I think you show Lewis working both as sort of a, a consolidator of this Catholic medieval tradition, but also as a, com- a mediator of that tradition to the very textures of modern life to me is like, that's exactly Lewis's accomplishment. And there's very few reader people I've met who actually kind of say that out loud. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and so first thing I just want to say is I deeply appreciated this book, partially because it, uh, 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 it was very, uh, it was cathartic for me uh, to hear some, yeah. you know, see somebody see that. And as I said, just before we hopped on, um, I was telling Dale when we, when we first got our copies that any book with a, with a, a title called Nostalgia for the Future, a chapter title called Nostalgia for the Future, mm-hmm. is so dear to me because I, one thing, I'll just, I'm, I'm speaking so much because I'm excited, but uh, mm-hmm. one thing on this program that we talk about a lot is how so many conservative movements are kind of uh, reactionary, and they're all about kind of getting back to the past and let's get back to enchantment from our disenchantment, that kind of thing. But the that focus on pulling the past into the future strikes me as just the motif that whatever whatever we want to call reenchantment is not becoming exactly medieval characters again. It, it's a it's a movement toward a, a future that involves gathering up where we are right now and moving through where we are right now. Uh, and so, first thing yeah. I'll say is just. Beautiful, uh, just a beautiful job. There's there's so many things to talk about, but uh, I, I just I just loved what you're doing with Lewis in this book. I sent you a quote, I think, in fact, just before you hopped on from yes. Miracles, Lewis yes. talking about the, the role of modernity as sort of the production of a, a mass civilization of knowing sages. Uh, right. And Lewis almost imagining himself as kickstarting that role <laughs> as, a, as a sort right. of popularizer in a sense. Uh, Dale, do you have any excited agitations to throw into the mix? No, I think you've happened? captured the. I think you've captured the energy. So yes, so yeah, Jason, I'm gonna have thank you write the afterward if there's a, yeah, if ever right. a new edition. Yeah, this is amazing. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Our pleasure. And okay. I love the. I, I love the cover art. Uh, it's, Isn't it extraordinary? Yeah. Yes, it captures the eye. Like I can imagine just walking by this book in a bookstore, going, "What is that?" Yeah. Um, My wife said she just, was going to buy it just for the cover. Yes, I'm going to frame this one and then buy another one because this yeah. is the review copy. Oh, this uh, is great. Yeah, this is lovely. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Yeah. yeah. So I guess one thing that we could get into, um, I, I, want, I, I would love to hear you um, tell the people that listen to us, begin in the first chapter, because I think that that is 
like all books, uh, the sort of cornerstone upon which the argument is built. You return to it again and again as, as an almost refrain, the way that uh, Lewis understand, understood the necessity for understanding the medieval model of the cosmos um, as a sort of cathedral. And then in contrast to the modern impulse to look at you know, uh, space, just using the word space, to um, you know, describe something cold and empty and lifeless and a sort of void, and the implications of how we understand how the medievals understood it and how the modern man understands it is much more than just simply a cosmology. Uh, it's actually a whole picture of what reality is. Yeah, I'd like uh, to call it an icon. An icon. Yes, you talk yeah. about that in the yeah. book. So maybe I think um, one thing, if you don't mind, is just getting into the way that uh, Lewis understood uh, the medieval cosmos. And then what about that view of the cosmos as a cathedral has been lost? Uh, and then we can we can move into other other points of inquiry. Sure. Well, yeah. And just start out with something light and easy. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think I think Lewis wasn't entirely sure, one hundred percent sure of what had been lost, and I think part of his kind of reverent, tentative study was, you know, had all the sort of drama of trying to get out of being imprisoned in a modern psychology. I mean, it's not for nothing that this is obviously in Surprise by Joy. This is his this is his conversion story, right? right. And as he says in Weight of Glory, as well as many other places, that in some sense, being modern is living under an evil enchantment. Mm. And I think what he, mean, what he meant by that was in an age of positivism, logical positivism, right? In which what we count, in which what we count as real is that which is measurable and ultimately reducible to experiments. Um, and seemingly, you know, the, you know, the funny thing is in the 17th century, this scientific methodology was launched by good Christians of, you know, Protestants and Catholic. But over the course of time, in some sense, the, the so-called natural methodology became so obvious and so effective that it just became an ontological uh, mm -hmm. methodology, right? That we just assume that not just that it was a more effective to, uh, to discover things by means of poking them and prodding them and watching them move within time, but we just assume that if you couldn't do that, it probably didn't exist. So Lewis is living in this age, which after which, hence his great inaugural address at Cambridge, after which this has already become obvious. So in a way, you know, someone like C.S. Lewis anticipates someone like Charles Taylor um, by a couple of decades that we're now living in a secular age in which the alternative has become unthinkable. This is the evil enchantment. So digging up this thing, right, digging up this ancient icon, as we've called it, or as Cicero calls it, the temple of the universe, or as I sort of play around with the idea, the cathedral of the universe, I think is, you know, an exciting project to do. Yeah. Here's how I might go about it. In the 50s, the particle accelerators were called the cathedrals of the 20th century. Hmm. I think I'd like to reverse that and call cathedrals the particle accelerators of the 13th century. Hmm. That is, there was this thought that, you know, I don't really understand, you know, this as much as I, I wish that I did. But in essence, right, these particle accelerators like at CERN, right, something like, you know, you know, they want to build a new one, which is going to be 100 miles around. Right now, it's only, you know, 20 miles around or whatever, right? Mm. Speed these things up, these protons, as fast as they can go running opposite directions. You want to get them as close to the, you know, the speed of light as possible. So I think my buddy told me something like, I mean, when you work with numbers like this, it almost doesn't matter if you get it wrong by, right. you know, an order of magnitude. But something like 4 million times per second, right? that's close to the speed of light. And then you run the protons into each other such that for a split second, they're sort of dissolved into subparticles, but maybe also this miasmic field of energy, but they're unstable in those conditions and they quickly recoalesce. But if that's our sort of vision of the world, even in us moderns, right? That there's this kind of pulsating energy, which expresses itself in the visible, even though the really real is this kind of quality, then even we believe in something approaching the iconic. That's what I think, you know, the medievals thought about in some sense, the natural world. Mm -hmm. In some sense, the natural world was a visible expression 
but it was longing to the extent it could to point at that which was um, invisible, that which was real, that which was energetic, that which was spiritual. That's what it was dynamically trying to make itself as present as possible, but failing to do so, not because of its own fault, but because of the very limitations of the visible structure. And yet with eyes to see it, you could see the world is saturated. You could see the world is sort of, I like to borrow from Umberto Eco's phrase as the sort of beauty is the spiritual radioactivity of being. Mm. Beauty is the spiritual radioactivity of mm. being. And thus a cathedral in some sense was like a big gigantic particle accelerator. And it sort of gathered all that, to, that stuff to a leaking point, <laughs> to a radioactivity point. And when people walked in, they said, without being blasphemous, oh my God, and meant it. Yes. And I think in some sense, that's what the natural world order is for the medievals. That's why they did art. That's why Dante wrote poetry. That's why cathedral builders built cathedrals was to recover that what I call an X-ray vision of the world, which was always there, but we could become blind and deaf to it. And hence the educational process, partly through beauty, partly through uh, music, partly through retuning the mind, think you know, think your Plato, right, was a way of getting back and seeing the world iconically. Mm. Mm. There's a, um, that's really fascinating. One of the things that makes me think of is, uh, uh, I love that, the particle accelerators of the 13th century. Um, last summer, I had a, the wonderful opportunity to teach discarded image to some folks. And one of the things that struck me in discarded image is that this is where Lewis makes the, the famous metaphor, right? The medievals looked up and saw the cathedral rather full of life rather than this kind of empty space, as it were. Um, but one way of looking at a project like the Space Trilogy or even Narnia, it seemed to me, and, and I said this to my class, uh, is that in one sense, what Lewis is trying to do sort of imaginatively is say, maybe the medievals got certain kind of technical details of the cosmic picture wrong empirically. But, but what modern science does in a sense, uh, if we have the right imagination and we see the, the kind of the metaphysical picture, the, the, the iconographic sense of the, of the medieval mind is that all we've really done when we've expanded the universe is expand the cathedral. Rather, perhaps what moderns should be able to do is say, the cathedral is much bigger <laughs> than, the, than, than the medievals imagined it. But the other thing Lewis does, it seems to me, and I wonder what you think about this, that uh, that, I, that is different to me than I think what I hear in a lot of cultural recovery projects is that in my judgment, the one thing Lewis always zeroes back in on to recover that kind of cathedralic vision of the cosmos is the, is, is the, the orienting place of just other persons the most holy thing you're ever gonna see, the most cathedral-like thing you're ever gonna see is just that guy giving you a receipt at CVS. And it seems to me that so many projects out there uh, are, are just so focused on it since kind of recovering the great things, which are good. We want cathedrals and great art and great whatever, but there can, there can it seems to me as a kind of work of the devil, <laughs> a deception of the devil slip into those very projects, a, a dismissiveness and, and an ethos about other humans who especially ideological opponents that is so uh, demonic on this other register and lewis is always reorienting us to say every person you see you're either helping them to heaven or to hell the medieval cosmos is also doing that the material he's trying to recover is doing that right, yeah, the right. role is that i right there <laughs> Uh, oh, sorry. No, I, yeah, I wonder. I wonder what you think of that as kind of a Lewis's focus, or, or kind of linking his 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 attempt to recover that kind of medieval cosmos, but also the the the, the strategy in a sense of recovering an enchantment of just that human face in front of you. Oh man, I think you just said a million interesting things, and uh, my only frustration with this limitation is I just want to sort of reach through the screen and give you a big hug because I think uh, I think that's really related to what you said at the beginning of this really fascinating figure who, although adores the Middle Ages and wants to preserve a space for thinking about iconicity, is also a committed modern, and as we know, sort of at the heart of modernity is for good or for bad, a powerful sense of subjectivity, interiority, and individualism. 
Mm-hmm. And so when you were talking, I sort of got this, this really cool uh, vision for a new Raphael-like school of Athens, right? Um, yeah, your, your watchers are going to remember that the school of Athens has this you know, extraordinary moment in which it's from Plato. And, and of course, Plato and Aristotle are at the center, but there's some Socrates and some Hippocrates and all the way down to his own contemporary artist, Raphael paints himself in and Michelangelo and, and other, you know, and other contemporaries, Dante shows up in multiple occasions. But if we were to redo the school of Athens, that in some sense, as Augustine says, try to pursue a project was ever ancient and ever new, then maybe in our school of Athens, in addition to our you know, our, uh, our Dantes and our ancient cosmos, we need our Kierkegaards. We need our, we need our sort of moderns who emphasize the extraordinary gift of interiority, subjectivity, and, and individualism rightly understood. And as you were talking, I was just thinking, that's exactly what um, Brothers Karamazov is about, right? Mm-hmm. You know, that, yep. that the line which probably all of your watchers and listeners have either stuck to a computer on their bumper sticker, beauty will save the world. I am 100% in agreement with that. But I don't think Dostoevsky means uh, going to art galleries will save the world, even though I right. teach art history, a huge fan of that. And I don't think he means that, you know, observing lovely landscapes in Tuscany will save the world, which is right. another thing I like to do. Um, but I think what, what Zosima does, and Dostoevsky through the mouth of Zos- Father Zosima, is recovers an ancient vision of the world as iconic in the sense that we've described, which Dostoevsky seems to borrow from Isaac the Syrian, right? This unbelievable sort of vision of the world so that you can become in love with all creatures and you let even reptiles, he says, even birds, even trees, even the whole world, because it's beautiful, you perceive its inner logoi, its inner forms, you let it become a hymn to God. That's just good biblical theology right there, straight out of the Psalms, right? Yes. How do you get to that ancient vision of things? Well, for Dostoevsky, and I think this is where his modernism comes in, right? His, maybe his Kierkegaardianism, right? You have to see human beings as icons. That is in this sort of long soul. There's a part of my soul which is rooted in heavenly realities, so great and so high that if I could see them, I would almost be frightened by their beauty. It sounds like yes. the end of weight of glory, doesn't it? Yeah. But on the other time, other hand, the, the soul rooted in depths and depravities of, of caves and mines of evil that under the right circumstances, I could indeed commit, right? Mm-hmm. Not necessarily will, but could indeed commit, right? Rooted in this sort of depravity. When we see each other as souls of that sort of, um, um, these kind of like double icons, superimposed icons of both good and evil, then in some sense, we get back into the mentality where we can see the natural world and its iconicity. I think that's a unique gift of modernity to the tradition. And I think that might be one of the things that Dostoevsky, but also Lewis, seemingly for independent reasons, brings to the great sort of dialogue of of ages of the church. And that's something I've been sort of imagining as well, is that in some sense, if we see uh, the, you know, the church as a great sort of parliament, but stretched throughout ages, mm-hmm. we have different representatives, which really get certain intellectual and moral virtues well, mm-hmm. to the point that they could sort of stand as exemplars over against every other age of the church. But that means that in addition to our own attempt to make up for all the blind spots, which we really have as moderns, which Lewis is so good at diagnosing, we might have a special voice in the great sort of in, in the great age of, uh, of of polyphony through these different sort of ages of the church. And yeah, so I think reading Lewis in that Augustinian vein of reverence, of pursuing that which is ever ancient and ever new, trying to make old things breathe new again is I think that's a great description of Lewis's project. Yeah. And it's, and it's, it's, it's breathing new again, precisely for the, and I think to go to Joe's point, the people that are right here in front of your face, it's your neighbor. And we live in a, we live in an age now where uh, the political fragmentation is so severe uh, that people are sort of coded as little, um, you know, ideas that deserve your slaughtering. Uh, but I, I was um, just talking to a buddy of mine. I was, I just got back from a vacation in Costa Rica. My wife and my family went down there for a week. My first time down there, it's beautiful. I love it. I want to go back all the time. 
we stayed in this little town called Nosara on the Pacific coast. And you walk out the back door in the morning and lay on the hammock. And that's where I was reading your book actually. Mm. Um, yeah, with, it complimented it so perfectly. And the reason that it complimented <laughs> it so- I wish you'd done some selfies and- uh, I did, I, yeah, I'll, I'll send you some brother. Yeah, good, good, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the reason it complimented it so perfectly is because there's one approach to the classics, the, our tradition, um, that's merely sentimental. And you talk about this in the book where it's like, if we could only go back, if we, like, if we could just go back to a simpler age. So I'm, I'm laying in the hammock and I'm hearing the howler monkeys scream and I'm listening to the birds sing their beautiful sort of forest choral. And I'm listening to the insects play their, their instruments, but 50 yards down the mountain, there's a family that's also on vacation and I hear their voices. And there was something that struck me. It's like, I think a lot of people in the modern age look at retreat as where can I go to get away from humans, from like the presence of another person because peace is being in tune with quote unquote nature. Mm -hmm. And that means no sounds of the city, no, no, no babies screaming, no voices arguing, mm. but out of that, that setting, the human voice is the highest of the creatures that I'm experiencing in the, uh, of the creaturely noises that I'm experiencing. Yeah. And it's the, uh, it's the very good. It's the noise of the very good. Mm. So yes, the monkeys are beautiful and the crickets and the birds are beautiful, but a person talking is the very good of that whole thing. And I think that one of the things that Lewis does is he makes you appreciate just uh, the, beautiful, the beauty of being, the standing out from nothing, the fact that something's here rather than not here is profound. And I think in the modern age, what we tend to miss a lot of times is when I look out my front window and I look at the palm trees, I live in Florida, I can take the ordinary as the mundane, whereas the ordinary is the most profound thing in the implication of what it is, that I'm not awestruck by its grandeur. I don't feel enough in my soul what that thing is representing. Um, and that's a tragedy. Uh, and I think that what you're doing in the book is you're saying that this medieval notion of the cosmos being full of life, teeming with life, bursting with life, rather than an empty sort of hollow void of nothingness needs to come to bear on our consciousness in a way that we can move around and appreciate all the things for what they are. And that orients the soul in a certain way. You talk about virtue and the ordering of the loves that actually shows us what is lovely and beautiful and good. And now we don't have to labor to find that which is, you know, good, true and beautiful. We just simply catch its scent through our ordinary life lived in our ordinary neighborhoods. And that's what I think that Lewis is doing well that you're pointing at in the book explicitly. And you're showing how that tradition has sort of evolved through the medieval ages. So, mm. yeah, that was just a comment. There's not a comment on the back of it, but just to contribute to what you were saying. Yeah, no, I, and it reminds me of uh, Lewis's kind of surprising comments at the end of Weight of Glory. And I mean, he, and I, I read about this in my chapter on Lewis and mysticism, is that on, on more than one occasion, Lewis mm. is sort of ascending to these, these kinds of rhetorical, theological, and spiritual heights, right? I mean, in Four Loves, of course, having talked about these different types of human relationships done well, done poorly, he finally comes to that platonic moment you've been waiting for in which he goes all the way up the ladder of love and gives, you know, three or four sentences to that highest level of eros with respect to the divine and then says, but maybe we shouldn't go into too much depth. Right. And he does something very similar in the weight of glory, right? Today is, today is a Sunday, but tomorrow's a Monday morning. Right. And I think um, for Lewis, he's just, well, because he knows what he was like as a young man, he'd become allergic to that type of spirituality, which is disengaged from the proximity and particularity of my neighbor, yes. um, at which 
the messiness of family life, the, the messiness mm. of community life, the messiness of, uh, of, you know, church life and belonging to a parish where almost everyone on your pew is imperfect, imperfect for some reason you can identify, right? But in some sense, that sort of, that sort of sense of particularity of, I seem, you know, the, the, full, the full Christian, the whole Christian, wants not only to have those kinds of moments of ascent, but then also those moments imitating, you know, imitating the Lord, those moments of incarnation in my particularity, in my proximity, in my presence and in my neighborliness. Um, and I think Lewis was really good at kind of counterbalancing that. And so the, the, the age of grand spiritual visions, think of like a Weston, right? Of, you know, I'm going to make this world lovely for people 400, you know, four centuries from now but I don't care anything about my neighbor right now. I think Lewis is great at sort of bringing that kind of Christian counterbalance yes. to what could become, as he talks about miracles, that vague lofty spiritualism, which could be, be absolutely abrasive with respect to those around me. Yes, that loves humanity, but hates that guy. <laughs> yeah, don't yeah, yeah. Stuff, right? yeah. yeah. Uh, I, the, I love humanity in general. It's just my neighbor I can't stand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, one of the motifs in the book that I... I just loved uh, uh, is this this uh, notion of sort of evil enchantment, largely kind of his reading of an, a dimension at one side, you might say, of modernity. There's the side in which modernity is a mediator of gifts, and there's the side in which modernity is its own kind of an evil enchanter in some ways. But you speak about counter spells uh, mm -hmm. in the next chapter. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it is in Weight of Glory, in fact, and I think you quote it here. In fact, I think it's at the, the epitaph of that chapter. Do you think I'm trying to weave a spell? Maybe I am, <laughs> Lewis mm -hmm. goes on to say. And there's this fascinating sense that Lewis is almost literally, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak in colloquialism here. He's almost trying to outvibe the devil through words. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that You get the sense that Lewis really is seeing a, a, in a, a stupor that he identifies largely as a stupor of imagination. And he is choosing whatever words he can. Uh, he's whatever combination of images and persuasions he can literally to dissipate and to decalcify the imagination so that it can breathe in life again. Uh, and even toward the end of one of the moments in Lewis that to me, uh, I, in fact, I, I teach a course for Davenant Hall on um, approaches to defending the faith. Uh, and I use miracles. And part of it is is this end bit in miracles where Lewis not only is, you know, it's a brilliant, brilliant argument, an incredible piece of rhetoric. But at the end of miracles, the way Lewis leaves the reader is, I'm afraid that you're going to close this book. And then the old imagination is going to come back. And here's what's going to happen. And there's this weird way in which Lewis is even trying to kind of jump out of the book after your response that's going to happen when the book is closed and sort of <laughs> work his magic on future you. Uh, mm -hmm. And there really is almost a, a kind of quite literal modern rhetorical wizardry, uh, for lack of a better phrase, that he seems to be accomplishing. And, you know, you wonder if he's not even being ironic when he says, maybe I really am trying to weave a spell here. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I thought I love that motif. Yeah, rhetorical wizardry. Uh, and uh, but I think it's a strange rhetorical wizardry, which is actually trying to get us to love really deeply, if I can, haptic, tangible, palpable, sensible realities. And you remember, there's that funny little moment in Screw Tape Letters where uh, the advice is: see if you can get your human subject to think it's super spiritual to give up her daily cup of hot chocolate, mm -hmm. right? And let let her have a sort of abstract religion, as opposed to if she actually does sit with that and does it in the right way and just thinks, glory be to God, I love hot chocolate. Yes. And sits there and has a time of peace. That's, that's potentially very dangerous because that sense of gratitude could overflow and kind of um, go up a couple of steps into higher and deeper levels of gratitude. Mm -hmm. So I think, in, you know, I think the breaking the counter spell, ironically, is trying to shatter, which I think Lewis thought was very modern about us, our weird addiction to mid-level abstractions in which we ignore both the concrete things of our daily life as well as the highest abstractions. Mm -hmm. We think that, you know, the, the second judgment or death or beauty, those things we're not entirely sure that they exist in modernity. 
but um, flattening curves and dis social distancing, these kind of um, not to get too political, but these kinds of <laughs> mid level uh, mid level bureaucracies, right? right? Those things seem the realest to us. Or you know, if we're in a you know academic context, right? Oftentimes, it's not about this particular whether this particular student loves an author, but rather it's about trends and retention rates. Right. Yes. Um, well, unfortunately, this year we've actually lost 17 percent of our students, which is up five percent from the previous years. And so we're neither, you know, I think as moderns in general. Right. I guess to, to a certain extent, Christians are trying to mitigate these negative proclivities. But as moderns in general, we're neither super abstract nor concrete or particular enough, but we're gumpuses. Um, mm. We are in this sort of mid-level and as you were talking, I just thought of this passage that I quote on, uh, on page 78. Um, Gompas says to Cas Caspian, your majesty's tender years hardly make it possible that you should understand, listen to all these mid-level abstractions, the economic problems involved. I have statistics, I have graphs, I have, but then Caspian interrupts. Tender as my years may be, I do not see that it brings into the islands meat or bread or beer or wine or timber or cabbages or books or instruments of music or horses or armor or anything else, anything else worth having. But whether it does or not, it must be stopped. And Gomez desperately tries to counter one last time with a mid-level uh, abstraction. But that would be putting back, putting the clock back. Have you no idea of progress, of development? <laughs> You know, for some, for some reason, I guess you could say it like this. For us, abstract words, which expand horizontally over time, that's what sort of, that's the, what controls our paradigm, right? Modernity yes. in some sense is, is, is founded with the very invention of the clock. Yeah. Um, in an age in which before the clock, right, you would just have sort of seasons of the day, but they wouldn't be sort of precisely machine-like articulated to the very second. In some sense, this is modernity, abstractions unfolding horizontally over the course of time. Whereas our ancestors, I think, would see of abstractions as unfolding vertically, right? Mm -hmm. both, the, both the loved particulars of this horse and this dog and this craft and this basket and this house yes. and this land, which I, which I have, you know, have been in generations. And the highest vertical abstractions of the theological virtues and uh, and the cardinal virtues and these kinds of huge level abstractions, those were what commanded loyalties. So the funny thing, going back to Lewis's uh, modern rhetorical wizardry, as, as you called it, is he trying to shatter our weird addiction to our sense of mid-level abstractions, which unfold in time and make us love the very high by means of loving the very low and maybe vice versa too. Mm. Yes. I wonder, um, I want to ask you about Dante um, because that's a chapter in the book that I've seen other authors sort of trace out some evidence of Lewis um, pulling off of Dante and his corpus. But, but before that, I wonder, Jason, if, so we live in a, you know, you have a chapter in here about uh, moving to the sort of a mechanical cosmos um, the, from symphony to machine. And I love this, the death of antiquity and the birth of the world of speed. And this is something that I've noticed, especially in the edu in education. It's like, OK, well, what is an apple? Right. Like the modern man says, well, an apple is this many parts water, this many parts glucose. Yeah, that's an apple. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Come on, dude. That's yeah. what I thought, honestly, when he said it. <laughs> yes. Uh, but it's it's a sort of dissect. It's dissecting things and pulling them out into their parts and then looking at them underneath of a microscope and saying, these are the smallest particles of the thing that is an apple or a mountain is merely a collection of rocks and we can look at the pebbles and then the dirt underneath that and then the grass and whatever um where for as the sort of medieval uh, understanding was just to take the thing as you encountered it it's like no an apple is that beautiful red thing that is sweet when i bite it and refreshing um and i i do wonder about the rise of a uh, not only the industrial age 
not just machines, but also the analytic philosophy that we're sort of being steeped in at the moment, which uh, its lifeblood is pulling things apart and looking at all of the particulars. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that per se, because we have the tools and the technology to do that. Uh, but what are some dangers about the way that we can sort of slice and die? You think of a MRI machine, right? I can get little slivers of my of my body that give one picture about all the parts of me. Is that me? That's not me. That's just a picture of slivers of my physical right. co composition. Um, but what, so I know that you, you talked about how Lewis recognized this trend with modernity, but is there a way to synthesize the symphonic approach to the cosmos while still saying, nevertheless, we are in the machine age. You know, and how how did that, did, sorry, how did that get back to Dante? Just to finish your well, question. I, well, well, it didn't. I want to ask him about Dante. But oh, that you're starting was, here. Sorry. Yes, that's I'm what I'm I'm ruining starting. it. That's okay. Yes. I think, well, I think the, as Lewis would put it, the ultimate danger of believing that the world is fundamentally atomic is that it cultivates what I call the, um, you know, the machinist or engineer's approach to the world. If all of it is just sort of particles, could it, which be ripped apart, then in some sense, everything is possible. <laughs> Those yeah. sort of haunting this whole conversation then I might as well just disassemble anything I please and rebuild it as anything I please. I mean, this is obviously sort of the political situation we're in now, right? If basically it's a will, it's a pure will just sort of hovering over the face of the deep, brutally imposing upon material reality, whatever I wish it to be. Um, I want to make my body in this type of way. I want to make your body in this type of way. I want to, um, I want to strip a, a landscape and rebuild it in this way. In some weird way, I think, you know, both left and right have this sort of secret alliance of this sort of deep <laughs> modernism that yeah. both believe that material realities are fundamentally destructible and rebuildable according to my will. Bacon mm -hmm. is the president of the United States, right? Descartes and Bacon, president, yeah, yeah. vice president, no matter what party's in office, right? But I think that that sort of sense of um, that you find in the deep ecology movement, that you find among sort of Byzantine Christians, the sense of the sort of sacramentalism of the body, of the world, that's the thing that gets lost, of course, if you have the machinist approach to, um, to the world. In terms of education, right? What if you're not just learning facts? What if you're not just debunking facts and learning about elements and how you can pull them apart and reassemble them according to your, 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 you know, your pleasure. Well, I think for our ancestors in pre-modernity, education is a war against forgetfulness. That is that moment of kind of sense of uplifting nobility, a kind of eternity moment. This is how Lewis describes it as joy, right? An eternity moment, which invades my time. Um, as moderns, we get sort of uncomfortable with it because we have this sense of bustle. Uh, T.S. Eliot says it perfectly in The Wasteland. He has this refrain that occurs, hurry up, please, it's time. <laughs> hurry up, please, it's time. Mm -hmm. And I had this amazing moment of reading that to my students. And I gave them all an anxiety, a panic attack, even though they had, you know, like, there's probably something you're forgetting you should be doing right now, right? Yeah, hurry yeah, up, yeah. please, it's time. And they all got nervous for reasons they couldn't explain. Our ancestors, though, I think are precisely militating against that sort of sense of bustle, of sense of haste. And when an ennobling eternity moment begins to erupt, education is about trying to make that stay, right? Trying not to lose the vision, trying not to lose the taste, trying not to lose that hunger and thirst for, uh, for beauty upon which perhaps all character is built. I think in terms of those are, the, those are the extraordinary pedagogical implications. Now, this is just a description of one or the other, isn't it? Not necessarily an argument for the favorability of one. But this is what Lewis does in Abolition of Man. Look, you gotta choose. You're gonna have, to have the war against forgetfulness, the attempt to cause moments of time to stretch them out, to dilate them as, as Augustine says, right? The distraxio, right? Of trying to get it to hold so that your character becomes formed by that. Either education does that or education builds 
the machinist who will, you know, you the images in Francis Bacon are really violent about what, what modernity mm. does to nature. You know, mm. they're, they're what we would now call sexist, right? Um, rightly so. But you grab nature by the throat and squeeze her until she gives you what you want. And then you build the world, right? That's our sort of deeply kind of, you know, modernist roots, I think, with respect to our bodies, with respect to material reality, with respect to creation. You got to choose one or the other, Lewis says in Abolition of Man. Yeah. And, and what, maybe one of the things that I think makes Lewis is such a, a, a special diagnostician is that he, and I think your book accomplishes this as well, is that he sees uh, he sees all those kind of intellectual developments in early modernity, but identifies the chief fracture as the 19th century, kind of like the vestiges of the medieval are still felt. Uh, and part of what I think that indicates, and I think this is just all over Lewis, is that it's not just kind of the downstream impact. He's not an ideologue. It's not just the downstream impact of ideas. It's the slow reshaping of human habit. So, exactly. that, so, so that the ideas just are implausible in a sense. And right. even like you just said about right and left, you know, a lot of people on the right think they have these ideas. But what you forget is like, if you still default to this, that that bustle, as you put it, that objectification right. of the other at the level of habit, kind of right. precognitive habit, right. uh, then you're just going to keep doing that. And, and another thing that um, comes to mind as you mentioned this is, but I, I think another thing you see in Lewis uh, you're talking about this temporalization of things. One motif that is fascinating in Lewis is how he he tries to bring together the vertical and the temporal. This is another way in which I think he tries to see modernity as having its own vantage point, but not at the exclusions of the vertical. And the one I'm thinking of is in that hideous strength, there's this fascinating moment where Merlin wants to chop off the servant's head, <laughs> right? He has this major reaction and the, and the St. Anne's people are like, I don't know if we're going to get along with this Merlin character. You know, he's a, he's a bit, uh, he's a bit primitive. Uh, but yeah, one, like Peter uh, trying to take off the ear, right? Yeah. yeah, and, yeah and the yeah. Latinist basically says something to the effect of he's from such a different time. And what this means is time is more important than we thought it was. And Lewis likewise has this phrase in, in, in miracles where he says the temporal, what, what has happened in physics uh, after Einstein, the in introduction of right. the temporal is yeah. something that also needs to happen sort of in in the traditional sort of theological and metaphysical right. apparatus, but it's a it's a synthesis, not a not a replacement. Uh, and so it's another there's another key there, it's, it seems to me, in which Lewis is kind of mediating, but also grabbing onto uh, the modern vantage point that he can as he as he sort of moves on. Um, Dale, did we get to your Dante question? I don't, I'm OCD. No, I, that's what I'll wrap up with, but oh, go good. ahead. Uh, yeah, Jason, if you want to respond to that. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that uh, that's one of my favorite things that he says at the end of Discarded Image is about the importance of models. And that he says, I know my reader has been just dying to point out to me that um, as much as I love the medieval cosmos, it has a single major flaw. It's not true. <laughs> it's like the last page. That's I know, right. I love that. Yeah. And Lewis says, yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> right? Yes. But I'm not trying to, um, and I think he's thinking Barfield right here. Um, I'm not trying to go back. I'm trying to go through. And I just want everyone to remember this interesting model in which, um, in which it wasn't it wasn't a problem which the spiritual world was somehow integrated with, with the visible and the physical without either of them collapsing into the other. And then, of course, he says, but that's exactly what modern science is doing now. We're talking about modeling, right? We're talking about how, in some sense, on the most primitive levels, whatever reality is down there is just expressing itself in this kind of limited visible pattern. And so I think if you asked, you know, Lewis, well, he actually, well, he says this in God in the Dock, right? What we need is not more little books about Christianity, but more little books about biology and chemistry with their Christianity latent. Yeah. You know, I, feel, I think you could found like the C.S. Lewis Institute, whose goal would be, you know, studying uh, quantum physics and particle acceleration and psychology, right? And you'd yes. want to have a couple of historians and literary people there as well to create this community. This, this community. But I think that's something that Lewis shared with Barfield, that sense of through modernity, not back from. Yeah. And the historian, the intellectual historian, the literary historian has a special role. 
of making sure that we don't just forget this fascinating model. But he doesn't think that that's in some sense the exclusive role of what you were talking about in terms of conservative culture saving. Let's yes, let's keep that on there. But we always we have to be um, kind of exploratory and bold and openly scientific in all these other ways. But if we keep the model in the back of our head, we're going to discover surprising ways in which it seems more urgent and yeah. more up to date than we had previously thought. That's right. Yeah. Mm. You know, you near the end, I, I'm going to ask, a, there's so much to talk about um, and we're, we're running out of time, but so talk to us. I have seen, as I mentioned, a lot of people sort of equate, not a lot of people, but several authors make, um, make the connection between Dante and Lewis, but you do it in an interesting way. And especially near the end of the book with Orwell and Dante in unveiling um, and I think that this is a very unique take. I haven't come across one. Maybe you have when you were researching for the book. If so, point me into some good directions where I can read more on this connection. Um, but maybe give us like a very broad sort of introduction to how Lewis is pulling from Dante, specifically in Orwell, for this this unveiling theme that you sure. show us. Yeah. But it's, one, it's one of my favorites. I think um, I sometimes say that, you know, there are two types of professors of literature, those who teach literature for the purpose of ethics and those for teach it for the purposes of epistemology, the sort of nature of knowing and being that you use literature to gesture at other worlds. I wish I were the latter, which I feel is like really deep and, you know, right, right. but I, unfortunately, I always revert back to just sort of morality and ethics. Being and, a boring moralist. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Kind of, I'm afraid so. But I mean, so, I mean, this, this is kind of a dear theme to me because I feel like, well, when I write about it, I actually make my own, um, you know, heart rate elevate. Mm. But essentially, I think if, if we remember how Lewis seemingly even thought about composition, one of the things that I say in the book is that Lewis didn't just get ideas from the Middle Ages, but he even got the process of how to make ideas into books yes. from the Middle Ages. Mm. So he got his composition tech, technique from the Middle Ages, which I think you could more or less call recycling. Yeah. <laughs> College professors call it plagiarism, uh, right? <laughs> yeah, um, right? Our medieval ancestors would have called it imitatio or imitation, which you take something lofty and noble and then rebuild it. Now, literally, they actually do this, right? All the great Gothic cathedrals are built within footprints that had been around for, you know, for already three or 400 years. Mm. So literally sort of rebuilding within the, na the natural sort of ground plans, the natural footprints, and then just making it a better structure, ever ancient, ever new. Mm -hmm. So part of my argument is that that's what Lewis is doing with respect to his own imaginative literature. He's rewriting Boethius, he's rewriting Dante, and... Lewis himself says that sometimes the author, the model author, the paradigm author gets so deep into your system that you can't quite remember if you're being faithful, translating him or inventing something on your own. Mm. Well, if that's the case, then I think we have a good candidate for this final unveiling scene of Orwell, right? Of course, she has this dream. Lewis is very careful to specify that it's a true dream. Yep. Which if you go to the discarded image, he talks about what true dreams meant to, for people like Macrobius. So we're already in a medieval key. Okay. She has a true dream in which she walks across this desert and is made to stand in front of this vast audience and deliver her best possible complaint against life, against God, right? Against the gods. And in the midst of this, she's stripped. She's made to sort of stand spiritually and literally naked in front of this huge audience. You know, the most, I think in a world in which we so carefully control our images, especially online, yes. can you think of anything more frightening, right? Um, just to be exposed in all possible ways. Um, and so I think it's an extraordinary moment for, for, for deep conversion in which I stop holding the voice outside, but I just have to let myself be seen warts and all failures and all skinniness and protrusions and all and just let me be seen in my particularity without sort of manufacturing how i wish to be seen wearing a veil over the course of my life which we can do in all kinds of uh, sophisticated ways now right yes. but the same thing happens for for dante at the top of purgatorio it's a funny thing because he's gone through all the layers of uh, of sort of 
prying off the fingers of attachment to different types of vices, right? He's gone through prying off the fingers of, of pride and envy and lust and gluttony and all these kinds of things. But when he gets to the top, seemingly it's still not good enough for Beatrice. And she sends him through this unbelievable, painful, <laughs> purgational scene in which Dante says, I felt like, he uses all kinds of cool images. I felt like a tree, a big oak tree, which was being ripped up by the wind. I had these sort of deep roots and deeply sensitive parts of the heart, right? And Dante has to unmask. He has to see himself. He has to, um, in a way, become sort of spiritually vulnerable, spiritually naked, um, and confess the deep root of, mm. uh, of what I call the, the ur sin, right? That sort of primal sin of thinking that eternal glory uh, can, be, can be completely captured by my own human intellect. And thus he has this moment of kind of deep repentance of, of the presumptuousness of the human condition. But those two kind of extraordinary conversion scenes, both authors, I think, really bring a lot of uh, understand what I mean by this kind of a lot of spiritual violence, right? Mm -hmm. The kingdom of heaven, right? Will be born away by the violent. Yeah. Bring this kind of, yeah, right. Bring this kind of spiritual violence to, to try to get all the way down to the center of the human heart. And I feel that. Um, yeah, and anyway, I so I too. think, I think that's a sort of extraordinary moment of what I call deep conversion, which Lewis was very faithful to, uh, um, to the spirit of Dante and, 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 and grasping. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you, brother. That was beautiful. I feel it too, very much. And it's yeah. something that Joe and I talk about in our private conversations because we can't unveil ourselves yet. That's for our final sort of podcast where we don't do any more podcasts. And then it's like, here's the unveiling. <laughs> yeah. I'm not <laughs> coming naked this. on the podcast though. So <laughs> yes, I, we're yes, going yes, to yes, keep yes. it PG over here. Yes. Yeah, yeah, good. <laughs> well, Joe, I'll let you have the last word, but I just want to register one more time my appreciation, uh, Jason, for you writing this book. I hope you have more projects um, in the pipe in the pipeline for, um, pr well, projects that are analogous to this. I would love to see more to sort of expand this out and develop it a tad more and fill in some of the chapters. Some of the chapters could be books. Um, so yes, keep up the good work and uh, we'll, be look, we'll be looking forward to more from you. Thanks. Yeah. It's been a uh, delight. Uh, I don't have anything else to say, Dale, so we can just... Uh... Okay. Well, um, everyone can head over to Amazon and pick up uh, Jason Baxter's book, The Medieval Mind of C.S. Lewis. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed the conversation. Anywhere else we can go, uh, Jason, to find out about you? Do you have a website or any other things yes. that we can? Yes, okay. I do. Uh, as I jokingly say, for uh, listeners and watchers who want to go vinyl and uh, <laughs> shop indie, you can go to my website, jasonmbaxter.com, jasonmbaxter.com. And I'm actually selling copies of it. I'll sign them and mail them out to you and include whether sort of random packing materials I have, probably a discarded lecture or maybe even a student paper. But uh, yeah, so jasonmbaxter.com, cool. you can get it from me and I'll sign it and send it out for the same price as Amazon. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Uh, head over to Davenant Institute um, on YouTube to find our previous channels. We're on all the podcast things. You guys already know the deal by now. But uh, Jason, thank you. Thank uh, you. Joe, love you. Love you too, man. And until next time. See you. Thanks. Thanks.